After the success of the Manhattan Project, as well as the triumphs of quantum mechanics and quantum field theory in the early part of the 20th century, the 1950s and 60s saw a huge demand for research into subatomic physics. The ultimate goal of this research was to find and understand the fundamental building blocks of matter. To this end, many new particle colliders and cosmic ray detectors were built to catch glimpses into the highest energies and smallest scales ever seen. The expectation was that at the bottom of everything, only a few truly fundamental particles make up all that we see in the universe, sort of how the proton, neutron, and electron make up all of the atoms in all of the complicated molecules discovered in chemistry. However, to everyone's surprise, this didn't seem to be the case. In fact, a whole slew of new, unstable particles were discovered, with all sorts of different spins, charges, and other properties. So many particles were discovered that it seemed hopeless to unite them into a single fundamental theory. The situation looked so dire that in 1955, during his Nobel Prize lecture, Willis Lamb joked that he had heard it stated that the discovery of a new particle should result in a fine rather than a prize. The story as to how this unfortunate looking barrier was resolved is fascinating both mathematically as well as historically. Now, I will note that to keep things somewhat simple, I will not discuss things exactly how they happened in history. In particular, I'll save any discussions of the property known as strangeness, as well as the so-called Eightfold Way, for a later video. Now, the first thing to note about these newly discovered particles is that they're all fairly massive when compared to other known particles at the time, like the electron and neutrino. The lightest being nearly 300 times the electron mass, or about one-tenth the mass of the proton and neutron. Due to this discrepancy in mass, these heavier particles were given the names of hadrons, from the Greek hadros, which roughly means bulky or large. These hadrons can be either fermions, known as baryons, or bosons, called mesons. Another thing that was observed about these hadrons is that many of them could be grouped together based on their masses as well as other shared properties such as spin and parity, though they may differ in their electric charges. For example, three spin zero particles with negative parity all have nearly the same mass, but one has an electric charge of plus one unit, another has charge zero, and the last has charge minus one. In fact, the masses of the charge plus one and charge minus one particle are exactly the same, and after further study, it was discovered that these actually form a particle-antiparticle pair. The other charge-neutral particle is its own antiparticle. All of these particles together are collectively known as the pions, and are given the names pi plus, pi minus, and pi zero based on their charges. In a similar way, three spin one negative parity particles, known as the rho mesons, all have nearly identical masses. Same with the proton and neutron, spin half particles, which can be referred to collectively as nucleons. The lonely spin one omega meson doesn't seem to have any partners, though its mass is somewhat close to that of the rho meson. While there are four spin three half delta baryons, all with different electric charges. Now, if you've taken an introductory quantum mechanics course, the sizes of these groupings, paired with their fermionic and bosonic natures, may look a bit familiar. In particular, they look suspiciously like the families of states we get when coupling together various numbers of spin half fermions. For example, when we couple together two of these spin-half fermions, we get two possible bosonic families, one with only a single element, corresponding to a total spin-zero state, and one with three elements, each corresponding to different total spin-one states. In a similar way, when we combine three spin-half fermions, we now get two fermionic families, one consisting of two total spin-half states, and another with four possibilities, each of which with total spin three halves. The numerical coefficients of all of these states are not super important for this discussion, 
but they can be found either by going through a fairly tedious quantum mechanics exercise, or can more simply be given by the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients, which pretty much physics has an excellent discussion of that I'll link in the description. The similarities of the families of hadrons to the spin families inspired physicists to introduce a new quantum number, analogous to spin, which they originally called isotopic spin, later shortened to just isospin. The hadrons of similar mass, spin, and parity can then be organized by their isospin. For example, the three spin zero negative parity pions can be collected into a triplet with total isospin one, in direct analogy to the bosonic total spin one triplet of states. Similarly, the three spin one negative parity rho mesons can be rounded up into another triplet of total isospin one, while the single spin one negative parity omega meson can be considered as a singlet with total isospin zero. As for the baryons, the spin half nucleon doublet can be considered as an isospin half state, while the spin three half delta baryon quadruplet can be described as an isospin three half state. Here, I want to take a moment to reiterate. It's very important to not confuse isospin and spin. While the total isospin of a particle and the total spin of a particle sometimes coincide, such as the case of the nucleons, delta baryons, and rho mesons, these quantum numbers are completely distinct. As an example, we can consider the proton. We can think of this as the isospin up state, corresponding to the total isospin half doublet. However, the proton can still either be in the spin up or the spin down state. Similar for the neutron. This can be considered the isospin down state of the nucleon doublet, but again, a neutron can have either spin up or spin down. Now, if we look at the combined spin states, not the isospin states, we can see that all of them can be built from just two fundamental pieces, the up state and the down state. So, we might wonder if we can do the same thing for isospin. In particular, we will consider just two fundamental particles, one up isospin particle and one down isospin particle, and try to build all of these more general isospin families from just combinations of these particles. Let's start with the nucleons. We know that this doublet has total isospin half, where the proton has isospin plus one half, and the neutron has isospin minus one half. In the case of normal spin combinations, we see that the spin plus one half state of the total spin half doublet is made up of two up spins and one down spin, while the spin minus one half state is made up of one up spin and two down spins. Directly applying this to the case of isospin, we can see that we can consider the proton as a combination of two up isospin particles and one down isospin particle, while the neutron is made up of one up isospin particle and two down isospin particles. However, here there's an extra complication, which does not arise in the discussion of normal spin. In particular, particles in the same total isospin family don't all necessarily have the same electric charge. So, we need to account for this by giving these fundamental up isospin and down isospin particles different electric charges. This is easy enough to do by just ensuring that the proton and neutron have the correct electric charges, giving us a system of equations we can solve to find that the charge of the up isospin particle must be plus two thirds, while that of the down isospin particle has to be minus one third in terms of the electron charge. Notice that these fundamental up and down isospin particles must be spin half fermions in order for a combination of three of them to form a total spin one half state. What about the other isospin families? Luckily, this works out nicely for the delta baryons, with the isospin plus three half delta plus plus baryon being a combination of three up particles, the isospin plus one half delta plus being two ups and one down, isospin minus one half delta zero being one up and two downs, and finally the isospin minus three half delta minus being three downs, just like the spin three half quadruplet resulting from combining three spin half particles. 
However, things get a bit tricky when considering the mesons. To see this, let's look at the omega meson, which we know should be an isospin singlet. If we go by direct analogy to spin, this particle should be a combination of one up particle and one down particle. The issue is that the electric charge of this doesn't work out. This combination gives a total electric charge of plus one third, while the observed omega meson is electrically neutral. It looks like this model might be running into some problems. Luckily, we still have one trick up our sleeves. Since the fundamental up isospin and down isospin particles are charged, they must also have antiparticles associated with them. But what is the isospin of an antiparticle? Well, we already know of a few particle-antiparticle pairs which have isospin, for example the pi plus and the pi minus. We know that the pi on triplet has total isospin 1, which has three individual isospin states plus 1, 0, and minus 1. As we saw with the baryons, there is a direct correspondence between decreasing the isospin of the state by one unit and decreasing the electric charge by one unit. So, we might suppose that the pi plus is the isospin plus 1 state, the pi zero is the isospin zero state, and the pi minus is the isospin minus 1 state. From this, we can see that when we take the antiparticle, such as going from the pi plus to the pi minus, we also negate the isospin. This also works for the pi zero, where flipping the sign of the isospin, zero in this case, has no effect. This is exactly what we would expect since the pi zero is its own antiparticle. So what does this mean for our two fundamental particles? Well, it tells us that the anti-up isospin particle actually has down isospin and vice versa for the anti-down isospin particle. So we can form this up-down combined state, which should make up the omega meson from either one up and one down, one up and one anti-up, or one down and one anti-down. However, only the latter two cases work out to give the correct electric charge of the omega meson. And so we can write the omega meson as a linear combination of the up anti up state and the down anti down state. Going through a similar discussion for the pions and rho mesons, we find that the pi plus and the rho plus are up anti down states, the pi zero and the rho zero are again linear combinations of up anti up and down anti down states, and the pi minus and rho minus are down anti up states. The difference between the pions and rho mesons being their spins and their masses. Now that we have the framework up and running, we can ask a question. Are these particles actually real, or are they just a sort of bookkeeping technique? It turns out that the answer to this question was actually debated in the physics community until the late 1960s when a technique known as deep inelastic scattering essentially a high energy version of Rutherford's gold foil experiment, showed that the proton was actually made up of other particles. This seemed to confirm the existence of these funny up and down isospin particles, which were given the names of the up quark and the down quark respectively by Murray Gell-Mann. The discovery of the quarks was a landmark moment in particle physics. It confirmed the idea that nature fundamentally prefers simplicity since just these two quarks can make up a large number of the discovered hadrons. However, as I'll talk about more in the next video, the addition of the quarks to the standard model resulted in several questions regarding how these quarks could possibly be bound together to form hadrons, leading to the discovery of a brand new fundamental force of nature.